Okay, good afternoon everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name's Andy Fish, a Technical Specialist at 3M Transportation Safety Division. Um, a quick bit of uh, background first before we begin. This is the third in a series of webinars uh, we've been bringing to you this year. Last year we asked, after a successful series of webinars and seminars, what people would like us to talk about and uh, we got a, a few suggestions and subjects to cover and this was one of them, traffic sign illumination. What we are going to cover here is the need to light a traffic sign. What I won't tell you about is how to light a traffic sign and lighting technology per se. That is not my area of expertise, so that wouldn't be the right thing to do. But what I'm going to talk to you about is the law and the decisions we make when choosing to light a traffic sign or not. And hopefully you'll learn a few new things. Um, as you may have seen at the beginning screen, if you do have a question uh, during this session, please do use the chat function. There is a little box on the left hand side and there was an instruction. I will just show it to you one more time in a second. As we go through this, if you do want to raise a question or just say something, please use that function. We probably won't be able to answer it as we go along, but if there's time at the end, we will answer them, we'll come back to them. Anything significant that requires some work, like I've had in the past, I will attempt to return an email to you fairly quickly if I can. So what are we going to cover today? We're going to cover the, the basics of traffic signing really. We have to go back to the first principles and talk about what makes an effective traffic sign. So anyone that's dialed into any of my previous webinar will be familiar with this kind of format. We have a little bit of a humorous look at what doesn't make an effective traffic sign and then look at the science behind that. Following that we'll talk about regulations and standards and why they're important, particularly with lighting because there are laws. And then we'll talk a bit about reflective material and why that's important. And at the end, we'll give some practical examples. And it's a bit of a quiz, really. It's interactive. So there will be a few sections where I do ask you a question, multiple choice. Please do answer. It does help us to, to make this thing flow. And it makes it a bit more fun to do. So uh, we'll, we'll kick off with an effective traffic sign. What really makes an effective traffic sign? So to figure out what does, let's have a look at what doesn't. Starting with this one. Not particularly effective, really. A bit confusing, really. This one, I've shown this one before. Often a sharp intake of breath. Should I laugh at this sign or not? This one takes a bit of a read before you figure out what's wrong with it. Somebody's added a new month to the year, it would appear. I should have perhaps changed the name to protect the innocent or guilty. This one I found quite humorous. Yeah, red, red squirrels drive slowly. It's possibly because their tiny legs can't reach the pedals. I've, I've certainly shown this one before. This is, this is a great sign. This is a sign that appears to tell you that there's a dull Highland Safari. Um, but with some brilliant marketing, the town of Dull, which is a very small town in Scotland, actually worked a twinning exercise with a town in Oregon called Boring. And just to prove it, there you go. Dull, tw twinned with boring. Absolutely brilliant piece of marketing. That's an effective sign. It certainly gets your attention. I think this one is perhaps an effective sign because it's effective at making me hungry. And it's about lunchtime now, so thank you for joining us over your lunch hour. I picked what this one up recently. Um, this is quite possibly an effective sign, but it's almost certainly a fake sign, I think. And everybody's least favorite of all sign, really, what is the point? I leave this one in there, and I always end on this one because it disturbs me. But this is a good example of a sign not being effective. And there's a reason why we find some of those previous images a little bit funny. There's some science behind it, believe it or not. And I'm going to take you through that right now. So the, the CIE did a study, number 74, and they determined what makes an effective traffic sign. And you need these four things in this order, in order to be effective as your traffic sign. The first and most important step is conspicuity. You have to attract attention. If the sign does not attract attention, then the driver cannot go on to attempt to read it. After that, it needs to be legible. And that means 
in all conditions and relevant distances, and that means nighttime driving as well. So this is where we'll come to a bit later with lighting. After being legible, being able to read it, the next stage is comprehensibility, to be able to understand it, because reading and understanding are two very different things. So I can read this sign perfectly well, I just haven't got a clue what it's trying to do. And the last thing, and possibly the reason why some of those at the beginning were slightly funny, is actually credibility, because the driver has to believe in the sign, he has to know uh, that, that what he's saying is true to be able to act upon it. So what influences these things? I, I've broken this down into some sort of macro areas that do affect those four. So starting at the left there, conspicuity and legibility are affected in a greater part by reflectivity of the reflective sheeting using colour, transmissivity, that's really for, for exter internally lit signs, and lighting of course, because if you cannot see the sign, if it's not reflective or not lit, then you can't move on to the next stage. And that also affects the legibility of it, the reflectivity, lighting, contrast, design and placement all affect those things. So if you look at the right hand side of that and highlight that, design, placement and lighting are actually affected by law, by legislation. So there are some controls that tell you where you can place a sign, how it should look and whether or not to light it. And if you then think about those two things at the beginning, the most two important, the two most important things, reflectivity and lighting there, that is absolutely critical for nighttime driving. So a sign does not appear the same in the day as it does in the night, hence the image below. So we'll come back to the <laughs> reflective part of it a little later, but let's start with standards because that's possibly the first thing you need to do when thinking about lighting traffic signs, you need to consider the law. And in this case we are of course talking about the TSRGD. Traffic signs, regulations and general directions 2016, as it now is, came into force in April 2016 and replaced the previous general directions from 2002. Now, there are many, many changes within that document, not notably actually the format of the document, which made it from a very difficult document that you flip backwards and forwards to another document that was quite difficult to do that you flip backwards and forwards. I'm not sure quite, I know what the intent was, it didn't quite work, because having to do some of this work, I've had to use that document a lot. But importantly, the requirement to illuminate many signs was removed. Um, and that's something that, can be used to an advantage, but also a disadvantage. So there are advantages to be gained from not lighting a traffic sign from in terms of cost, but there could be disadvantages to the driver. So I'm going to try and cover that now. But to recap on, tw on the 2016 changes, just a few highlights from it, not exhaustive list. But as you know, many of the warning signs, the lighting requirements were removed a few years ago, but a further few have been completely removed. These, for example. Some interesting wording changes with speed limit signs. So these signs, for instance, only require to be lit when used as a terminal sign on a primary route within a system of street lighting, which is quite a few little caveats to get into your head. And that also bearing in mind that with TSRGD 2016, a terminal sign does not need to be two signs placed as a terminal either. So it's the it's the purpose of the terminal sign. So it, it does make things a little bit more confusing if you're comparing to how you used to work, perhaps. The next regulatory signs. So obviously important safety signs still need to be lit within a system of street lighting. One exception, of course, no entry. This, sit, this sign still requires to be lit at all times. And that's because it's often, but not always, often in a position where it receives little or no light from the vehicle headlights. So, it's, it's, so if you're depending on reflectivity, this sign would not work. And we'll talk exactly about how that works later because it's often misunderstood. Critical bridge sorry, critical weight and height and width restrictions. 
also needs to still be lit as do warnings of the same kind of style. If it's a warning sign, 50 meters of a street lighting, and it's safety critical, I think is the words that they used in the circular, then it still needs to be lit. Good example there. Now you can of course, and you should of course, check the TSRGD to, to understand whether or not the sign needs to be lit in the first place. But actually, I went in doing my research for this, I happened upon some software from Buchanan Software. It was a conversation I was having with Simon Morgan at the time, and they'd created a nice little tool which I've used. Um, it's free to download and free to use, and you simply put in your diagram number and the condition uh, of the sign, so its position and where it is, and it will tell you what the requirement in TSRGD 2016 is, whether you need to light it or not. And very helpfully, it does say to you, if you do not need to light the sign, Use your engineering judgment to determine whether additional illumination is needed. And we're going to try and go through some of that today and try and give you a bit more help in using your engineering judgment. So thinking about what we've just said and bringing back that science, if you are not directly lighting the traffic sign, how does the driver see it at night? If there's no light source on it, how does he see it? Well, it comes back from those first two stages there, reflectivity, so retroreflectivity in this case. And it is critical, as we said. So if we're thinking about that, I'm going to have you a quick question here. If, you, if you're relying on reflectivity and you're specifying a sign, I know there are multiple answers to this. This is very simple. If you have a warning sign, it doesn't need to be lit. It's not in a system of street line, lighting. So the law tells us this sign does not need to be lit. What class of material would you choose? This is going to be a quick survey. We're going to put a question on the screen in a second. I'll give you a chance to think about it. Would you use RA1, RA2, R2, R3B, or don't know? We will actually cover what those classes mean shortly, but I'm just going to do a quick knowledge check now. So if I could just have the question on the screen, it should be there. What I'll do is I'll wait till most people have answered. We've got 48%, 62. Once we get above 70% people answered, I will probably just move on because that should be enough. Okay, so there we go. 74% have voted. So 65% of you said RA2, 12% of you said RA1, 4% said R3B, and 19% said don't know. Actually, don't know is possibly the right answer in many, many ways, and we'll come back to that later. But... If you take things by the letter of guidance, which is interesting, then firstly, as I said before, TSRGD 2016 does not require the sign to be illuminated. BSEN 12899, the current standard for traffic sample signs, recommends using R3B. And we're going to demonstrate why and what a little bit later. So just as you can see, here's the excerpt from the National Annex. Um, and you can clearly see there it says locations where high performance are required, class R3B. It does not really dictate um, what high performance is. It does, however, in note three, say that in the case of warning signs, where these are not directly lit, high performance microprismatic material are, should be used. So there, are, there is guidance that says you should use R3B, but there's not really any science that tells you why. So we will actually cover that in detail. So before we move on to the reflectivity, I just want to quickly summarize this so that there's no ambiguousness about lighting. Effective traffic signs need to meet as many drivers' needs as possible. And that becomes really critical at nighttime. The light the need to light many signs has become deregulated. There is not a requirement to light many, many signs, but there's a huge difference between required to by law and the need of drivers, and that will cover the needs after this next section. So, so if we talk about reflective sheeting and classes of material, which may be an alien concept if you've just dialed in and you're not familiar with the subject, actually, it's, it's quite a difficult one to explain in, in a short session, so I'll keep this very, very brief. There are actually three different types of reflection. You have something that's familiar to most of us, a mirror reflection. If you shine a light on an object, on a mirror, at an angle, it, it bounces off at the opposite angle. Diffuse reflection, 
we're kind of familiar with if you just look at how the lights in your room as you just turn your head to look at the lights in your room bouncing off the wall that is diffuse reflection retro reflection is how a traffic sign works and effectively we take the light from the, the source which is the headlights of a car or vehicle in this case it bounces off this reflective surface and comes back to the source exactly back to the source so in this case from the headlights back to the driver's eye which is quite a neat trick actually when you see it done explaining some of the language that's used but we won't go into too much detail just to be complete the most important thing here to bear in mind is the what we call the observation angle and that as you can see on the screen from in the little green section the alpha is the angle created between the headlights the driver's eye and the reflective surface that's what we call the observation angle and if you think about that when I draw the little truck over it in a second firstly as the vehicle approaches the sign that observation angle changes so it changes dynamically all the time so it's never one thing because as the car gets closer that angle gets bigger but also if you're a truck driver because you sit further away from the headlights and considerably further away as well a, a lot further than the car at the same distance to the sign your observation angle is greater which means at the same position on the road a truck driver gets considerably less light from a retro reflective traffic sign the opposite is also true of, of um, motorbike riders they, they tend to sit very close to the headlights so they tend to be very very bright other consideration is the entrance angle and this is important for some signs and that's why I've highlighted our, our little friend the no entry sign there and, and that's this this material these signs have to return light back to drivers at an angle so that traffic signs are not normally exactly perpendicular they can be uh, but they can angle they can vary and that is what we call the entrance angle and if you consider a no entry sign for instance if it's actually on that right hand turning on on the wall of the building next to the turning it's at 90 degree entrance angle it receives no light from the headlight it cannot return light which is why they tend to be lit and should be by law so how do we do it? How do we actually return light back to the driver? Here's a little science bit and a bit of a history lesson. This technique's been around for a very, very long time. So back in 1939, the first retroreflective sheeting traffic sign went up just outside of Minneapolis, where 3M are based. Um, it was a 3M invented concept using tiny little glass beads as a reflector. These microscopic beads sit on the surface of a sheeting and the light hits the bead, bounces through the back and comes back. So the effect is that the bead becomes a lens and a reflector at the same time. Very clever technique, very simple, still used today. Glass bead technology is still very common. The problem with a glass bead is only 28% of that surface, that sphere, can actually bend the light back to the driver. Because of the shape of a bead, the rest of the light goes off sideways, goes off not back where you want it to go. So you can't make it more efficient. You can put more glass beads, get them closer together, lots of things you can do over the years to make them more efficient, but there is a limit. So back in the late 70s, early 80s, 3M developed microprismatic sheeting so when people refer to prismatic microprismatic they're talking about this kind of design it's not just 3m that make this but it is 3m that design this stuff and um, what we have effectively are tiny little prisms embossed into a film very very thin these little prisms effectively the corners of cubes bounce light and because it is what it is a little prism the light bounces once twice and then on the third bounce it comes back to the driver so actually we can get a lot more light back so we can actually get about 36 percent of the light hitting it can come back to the driver which is pretty good it's a big increase from our beaded technology but it's still not efficient because if you look at that under a microscope the corners of those little cubes don't allow you to get three bounces we could the light will only bounce twice so therefore it doesn't come back to the driver so that surface is not really fully active or as active as it could be i should say so what, what we did a little later on with the diamond grey product is this. We took the parts of the material on the left that do reflect lights. We made a strange little pattern on the right, and that basically removes the dead spots effectively. I'll show you that under the microscope, and you'll see it much better. 
So there we see now we've removed the dead, dead spots, we now get full light return efficiency. How does that pan out back to classes? Let's bring it back to what we were talking about. Now understand roughly how it works. Classes of material, RA1, glass beaded technology in general, can return up to about 16% of the light from the headlights to the, to the driver. Class R2, RA2, whether it's beaded or prismatic material, returns up to 36% depending on its technology. And then class R3B, ours in particular, will return up to 56% of the light. So it gives you a good indication of how much more efficient these types of sheeting are. So this is why it's more effective in certain conditions. So that's all fine knowing we can give more light, but how much light do we need and why do we need it? We'll talk about that very briefly. So firstly, as we age, we need more light to see the same thing. And it's shocking, really. We're all living longer uh, and we're all driving longer. Certainly if you drive around here on a Sunday, you'll see that. Every 13 years of age, you require double the amount of light to read the same information, which is quite shocking, really. And I'm certainly feeling it now. That means that you need eight times more light in your 60s as you did in your 20s just to read the same information. So, you know, we, drivers in general need more light. And we talked about this earlier. Truck drivers receive less light. They get less luminance from the sign at the same distance as a car because they're further away from the headlight. There is there, that beam of returned light is less intense further away. Then you do have something with lighting technologies. Modern headlamps, by xenon type headlamps, have a much sharper cutoff. They're much more focused. So they're very, very bright on the road, as they should be, but they have a very defined cutoff so that there's less light spill. So any sign that's high mounted or mounted over to the right, as you can see, there's an actual image of a UK car with headlights, get less light from the headlights in the first place. And to illustrate that, a bit more graphical, this is very approximate, it does append, this obviously depends on how far away you are from the sign as to how much exactly, but as an indicator, sort of 50, 60 meters from the sign, you're getting that much. But lower left signs down there get 100% of the headlights, very bright. Upper left, 70%. Over to just move that same sign over to the right, same sort of distance from a carriageway, you're getting 66%. And up onto a gantry set sign, 47% of the light hits it in the first place. So if you're getting less light hitting it, you need to return more light somehow. Fairly basic principles. The other thing that gets forgotten sometimes, particularly with lighting a traffic sign, regardless of whether the law says you should or shouldn't, is that traffic signs are competing all the time, particularly in town centres. They compete for visual attention. And as you saw back in those first principles, you really need to be able to see the sign to be able to read it. If the first thing to do is attract attention, and that's quite hard when you're competing with restaurants and all night stores and all kinds of stuff in city centres. Urban areas are quite distracting to drivers. If you're driving through a brightly lit area at night, you're sometimes looking for the, the, the street sign, you're looking for the direction sign, and actually they can be difficult because of the amount of light pollution around. A little map on the right there I found, um, it's quite interesting. You can, they're obvious where the light pollution centres are in big cities. But there are some strange places where you think, oh, okay, really, it's that bright there. But how much do we really need? Well, there's this, this is a contentious area. There are lots of studies on this. It's fairly com controversial, as it says on the slide. There are accepted minimums, and there, there are some maximums. The way I view this, I'm looking here at some just trying to find a common sense number there's there you, there are arguments to say that direction signs need a different amount of light to a, to a warning sign but i'm going to try and keep this simple for the purpose of here and i'm going to really go with um some minimums and maximums so dr helmut frank study um which is the reference at the bottom there if you if you'd like to have a look at it at some point it's well worth a, a bit of research says that in a dark area you need three candelas per meter square. Now that's the first time I've introduced that language. Now candelas per meter square are a measurement of illuminance, how bright an object appears. And it really is 
as it sounds, candelas per meter squared. So one candela per meter squared has the same kind of brightness as one candle in a square meter. So if you've got something that's a hundred, if you've got a hundred candles burning in a square meter, that's a hundred candelas per square meter, which would be a very, very warm birthday cake. I won't tell you how many were on my last, but I need a lot more light to see the same information. So that's the, so three is the dark area. So if you're not competing with the light, then you really need a minimum of three. And if you're in an illuminated area, that minimum is 10. There are research to say what the maximums are, but actually they're quite huge. If you can see, it's pretty much 10 above maximum. So huge numbers for maximum. So you can be very bright and still read it, but once it gets very low, below three, you can't. And that's the number I'm going to use, and I'll explain it in a second. Best way to do that is with some practical examples, I think. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an example first, and then I'll ask you a question. So what I'll do is I will show you something like this, and I'm going to give you a, this is my roadway scenario. So we've got our familiar sign from earlier. I'm going to place it a meter and a half off the carriageway and two and a half meters to the center of the sign on the left. Now we're not in a street lit area, so TSRGD does not tell us we need to light this sign. What I want to establish here is what science says. So what I'll show you after I've asked you your questions is this, my little chart. To explain the chart, on the left we have a moving graph, a graph of the actual luminance that the driver requires, the driver receives. So this is a calculated luminance. It's quite difficult to do. There is software that does this where you need to put a lot of data into it. And what it's done here, I've got three classes of material. They're hours, they're 3M materials, actual measured results. This is not um, uh, an estimate. So RA1, R2, and R3B. And the chart pretty much moves, as you can see, the little car at the bottom moving from right to left towards the sign. So you can see that as it approaches the sign, the, the driver gets less light. And just to overview Dr. Helmut Frank's numbers, the red bit would be the under three, so that, that's not serving anybody. So between three and 10, as we established, was good for rural environment, good for it's not lit, which is our case here. And optimum for urban when it's lit is the green bit at the top, well, 10 to 100 on this scale. So as you can see, based on that, all classes of material, including RA1, actually give a car driver enough light. So lighting is unlikely to be required. However, do not forget things like accident black spots and your engineering judgment. Sometimes you may need to light a sign even if the law and the science says not. It's down to judgment. So now we're going to do a little bit of an interactive quiz. We're going to see how you would do, deal with this. I'm going to get some feedback here. So here we have the same sign, of course. We're going to go on the same journey with this little sign. But now we're going to mount him on the right. Same height, two and a half meters to the center of the sign. Non-lit scenario, again, doesn't need to be lit. So it doesn't need to by law. It's over there. Would you like this sign is the question. So let's have this quick quiz. Hope it goes on the screen. Should be a quick one. This shouldn't be difficult. Yes, no, or don't know is fine. I'll wait till you've all voted. Oh, interesting. I, I like these bits because I get to see live what people are saying. We're almost at the 70%. And now once we get to that point of 70% people voting, I will close the voting-ish. So currently, we have 56% say yes, and 41 say no. Okay, so let's see what the science says. I do feel like a game show host when I do this. It's quite good fun. So yeah, a car driver receives ample luminance from all classes, fairly similar, as you saw, from its left-mounted counterpart in the non-lit environment. So all classes, R3, R3B, R2A, RA1, all give you plenty of luminance. But let's remember this sign particularly is not intended for car drivers. At 4.4 meters height, it would be a very, very large car. So back to our little first principles again, I'll reference my little truck. They get less light at the same distance. So let's have a look and see what it is for a truck driver. We change the animation slightly and it changes a little actually. R3B gives you plenty of light right the way down. Gives you right If you want down to your three, it gives you it right up until about ooh, 40 meters from the sign. Pretty good. R2, 
and RA1 really don't give you much um, once you get to 100 meters from the sign. So realistically, because it's on the right, you've lost enough by moving it to think about a different class of material or potentially lighting it. Scenario number two, just to show the subtle differences, we just moved the sign a little higher. So now we're 3.5 meters to the center of the sign. It's now right mounted, high mounted, I'd consider. Would you light this sign? Let's see. A slight delay before I get the votes in. Oh yeah, 50 odd percent already voted. Well done. Very quick. Oh, 71 percent voted already. 78. Well, we're, we're very much almost all voted. So 54 percent said yes. 43 percent said no. And 4 percent said I don't know. Let's have a look. So I'm going to show you now. Forget the car driver. I'm going to show you the truck driver view because we've established this is for truck drivers. So those of you that said yes. Yes, you, you could probably should consider it because we're talking about a high mounted sign on the right. R3B would give you good luminance up to 40 meters. So if you're going to use any material and not light it, then you, you should really only use R3B because R2 only works up to about 100 odd meters from the sign. RA1 does not supply enough luminance at all. So if you're going to consider, you should consider lighting that sign, maybe consider mounting it slightly lower would help you enough to, to not light it if you're trying to avoid the cost of lighting, but consider drivers and consider truck drivers in particular for this sign. So the next logical step would be to ask you this one. So here we have center mounted, quite high mounted, 5.5 to the center of the sign or thereabouts. It's a non-lit area, so the law does not require it to be lit. Let's ask you the question, would you like this sign? A reassuring number coming up there so far. Okay, so we're, we're already at 77, very quick voting in that one. So 63% of you said yes, 37 said no, and nobody said, I don't know, which is really, really good, actually. Nice to see no indecision on this one. And here is the science. I'm going to show you first, though, just to be, just to be slightly difficult. They actually, remind us that TSRGD, the law says this sign does not need to be lit. So if you're a car driver, this is what you actually get from our material, certainly. So RA1 absolutely does not give enough luminance for car drivers. It doesn't get above three. It's very, very low. R2 gives you reasonable, down to sort of 60, I'd say 62, 63 meters from the sign, you're getting between three and 10. It's okay for car driver. R3B is given good luminance all the way through. But back to what I said before, this is not for car, for car, car drivers, this is for truck drivers. And this is why this slide illustrates the difference. Because when you go to the truck driver view, this is what happens. R3B does give you adequate performance up to about 60 meters from the bridge, which is okay. But at 30 miles an hour, that truck is just 4.4 seconds from the bridge. So if you're trying to serve the audience this, this is intended to, despite the law saying no, then the science would tell you to light it. So it, it's an interesting one because the law is sometimes at odds with because it can't serve every purpose, but, but you need to when you're trying to specify traffic signs and trying to decide whether you need to light them from a cost or performance point of view. There are lots of considerations. So that's enough of the journey for that one. Now we've got one. Uh, this is... Uh, I've got one more one. Have we got one, we've got one more? Oh, okay, so we've got one more actually and then I'll show you the difference. We talked about entrance angle. So this is a tricky one. So same sign, but now we've twisted that sign by 30, 30 degrees. Now I asked a few people how often that happens, and uh, a few sign makers actually. I said, well it does happen, on, particularly on rail over road bridges, because the railway line is going where it's going. A road tends to be fairly, road bridge can be square over, but railway bridges are often at angles, so, and if they don't build out the sign, I've seen many signs done correctly where they angle the sign to be uh, perpendicular to the road, you get lots of light. If you bolt it onto the side of the railway bridge, it could be at quite an angle. 
So bearing in mind it's twisted, it's only 2.5 meters off the ground, so back to our low height again. Would you like this sign? Oh, I like this one. This is slightly different again. So we started off at 50-50. Uh, and there's just been a large influx coming in to say, we'll stop that there. Everyone, 38% yes, 48 no, and 14 say I don't know. It's an odd one, I know, isn't it? But it's an example there to prove a point. And I'll show you that from a truck driver's point of view again. So R3B again gives lum good luminance up to 70 meters from the sign. R2 gives you 100 meters from the sign, it's not particularly great. RA1 stops at about 130 meters from the sign, giving you good enough luminance, simply because you've twisted that sign. So you could consider lighting it, absolutely. But also think about design here. Could you mount the sign lower, because where it is? Could you reduce the twist? Could that be somehow done? Could you just engineer it so it's closer to the, the something else so that you could stop that 30 degree twist. And just to show you how much that is affecting, I'm going to show you what it's like when you reduce the twist to 15 degrees. You reduce the twist to 15 degrees and you can now see that R3B is now giving you good luminance right up to 40 meters from the sign, which is pretty much the usable distance. After 40 meters, if you haven't seen it, you're not going to react to it. So just changing the twist on the sign gives you enough luminance for reflective material to work. So you know, there's, there's a lot to be considering when you're having disadvantaged signs. Now we're used to the numbers and the, you know, how, this, how the candelas per square meter works. It was of note and of quite a bit of discussion with the DFT in TSRGD 2016 when they removed the need to light the sign on a self-writing bollard. So self-writing bollards, not trans-illuminated bollards clearly, no longer have to have the sign face, sign face illuminated in a street lit area. But why did they do that? Is that does that make sense? After what we've just seen, um, does that make a lot of sense and should you still be thinking about this? So I ran a slightly different number for this one and I'm going to ask you a quick question, have a guess. There, there's no right or wrong answer to it. Well, there is a wrong answer, but a bit of fun actually. Bear in mind those numbers we've just seen. How much light do you think a car driver gets from the bollard in its center position? The answers are there, 10, 100, 200, or 500 candelas per meter square. I don't expect many to know the answer, so a bit of fun guesswork perhaps. Okay, are we above, we're above 70%? Yeah, okay, we'll stop that there. 39% said more than 10, 50% said more than 100, 4% said more than 200, and 7 said more than 500. Slightly different graph, because we've got two things here, I mean, really, on a bollard. We've got the fluorescent yellow section, which is reflective, and we've got the sign arrow, which is white. I've included the blue here because there's not very much of it and it's considerably dark. But the yellow section of the bollard, the bit that drags your attention, not necessarily the sign, gives you, as you can see, at it very, very close to the bollard, its peak, as I asked, over 500 candelas per square meter. In fact, it always gives you more than 100 in that central position. So that's why they don't need to be lit. Because in general purpose, when they're used at that kind of, as they often are, they are very, very bright. Providing they're maintained and cleaned, I might add. There are some around that are not, and they, they clearly don't do their job. As you can see, the white sign face, the white arrow, gives a tremendous amount of luminance, as it would do in that position. But, that, but you still need to think about that. This is in the center island. So this is getting full headlamp pretty much all the time. It's not got a blind spot, it's not in the high left, it's it really receiving a, the maximum amount of light it can from the headlight. And these numbers are with a 3M product on, I should state. So yes, they return a lot of light to the driver. But think about that again. If you position that bollard somewhere disadvantaged at an oblique angle, somewhere very, very far from the car headlights, you may not be serving the driver. So even with such high performance and with, with the not, need not to light a self-writing self bollard, Sometimes for the driver, 
a trans illuminated bollard may be the right choice, but you need to use your judgment on that. Just trying to give you some science behind the decisions that have been made. So we're just beginning to wrap up here. We've got a few minutes to go. I'll try and summarize what we've said and what we've gone through with some helpful hints. First thing, go back to those first principles there about conspicuity and legibility. Lighting is part of that. Lighting is an important part of that. And lighting, be that externally, a luminaire, or by reflectivity, is the first stage in being able to understand and read a traffic sign. So it is critical. From a steps, really in deciding to light a traffic sign, check the legal requirement. If the TSRGD says you must light the sign, then you really must light the sign. And usually there's a good reason for that. There's a scientific reason why they still require you to do it. And that is to serve drivers. And that often gets forgotten. The next step, do you require high performance material? Does there are there is guidance to tell you when to use high performance material, but not what high performance is. Hopefully we've shown you a bit about what that is today, which may help. And of course, not last but not least, will the sign meet drivers' needs? In the particular example we gave with diagram 530A, it is aimed squarely at large vehicles. So you have to consider that. We talked about high performance, and I, I work at a company that does like an acronym or seven, and um, I thought it would be nice to have a little acronym to remind us about when to consider it. So I've come up with one, and I'm going to show you it right now. So first thing, think about, is the sign competing with other light sources? It needs to be stand, seen to be standing out. It needs to stand out to be seen. So you need to consider performance or lighting. If it's right mounted, it receives less light from the headlights. You need to consider performance or lighting. If it's angled, it gets less light returned, as we see quite dramatically, actually. It get, so that can disadvantage the sign. And there was a study done in, back in 1995, now a while ago in London, that said that 20% of signs are over 15 degrees entrance angle. 73% of all roundabout signs are over 15 degrees. So actually, they do occur. Then there's serving HGV drivers. We keep saying this, but it's such an important point. HGV drivers receive less light than car drivers at the same distance. So consider lighting for them and consider performance. And to frame that little, that little thing there, 1,753 bridge strikes were recorded in 2015 to 2016, according to the Office of National Statistics, 90% of which were rail over road bridges. So the disruption it causes by not lighting a sign when you should, or not using a performance material when you should, is considerable. And the last, of course, high mounted. It clearly receives a lot less light from the headlights. You saw from the earlier slides, 47% less. If it's needing to serve drivers, you need to consider performance material or lighting. In some cases, regardless of what the law says, you may need to light it. So if you put all those little letters together, you get this rather disturbing acronym of CRASH. I have to say, I'm, gonna, I wasn't gonna, I'm not sure I was going to say this, but when I first started this slide, I started with serving HGV drivers high mounted and angled, and I ended up with a badly spelled shark. But CRASH seemed to resonate so much more with the audience. <laughs> Quick summary, and if we've got a chance, we may look at some questions. From me, TSRGD removes the requirement to light many signs. It does not remove the, the need for signs to be lit to serve the road user. I think from the position of the road user, because that's what the sign is intended for, not necessarily the budget holder. And that becomes really difficult when we're trying to save money, when there's less and less money to put in the lighting infrastructure, how do we serve road users and still save costs? It's a very difficult balancing act. A summary of some do's. Do use TSRGD 2016, I can't stress enough, it is the law. But use tools available, e.g. Buchanan Computing's little piece of software, if it makes it easier and simpler for you to make decisions. But overall, use your judgment. Do not just make one rule without thinking about drivers. As the standard says, use R3B material when high performance is required. And use that on non-lit warning signs. Cons consider lighting line signs when they are disadvantaged.
now we know a bit more about what means what a disadvantage sign is an effective sign as I've said before needs to meet as many driver needs as possible and this becomes absolutely critical at night if you're going to do this and you're going to make decisions on lighting and you know a sign is disadvantage risk assess it properly there is guidance out there there is data out there you can form a, a, a proper risk assessment where you can decide whether you should or should not light a traffic sign so that is all for me thank you I've been Andy Fish um, we have an, a future webinar coming up uh, in 2018 please do sign up if you would like to come and see that that is on the subject of sign clutter it's going to take me a little while to do that one it's a very interesting subject I've got quite a few images for that one so far so please do um, please do sign up for that one and I'm just going to have a quick look we have a couple of questions we are running very much out of time here ah, so we have a quick question your examples didn't comment about 20 mile an hour zones do they need to be lit I would comment from memory the vast majority of signage inside a 20 mile an hour zone does not need to be lit that was part of the deregulation within 20 within TSRGD 2016 even the terminal sign at the beginning of the zone I see from memory doesn't need to which is a what, 672 whichever diagram number it is if I'm, I'm not sad enough that I read the TSRGD every day but I was surprised at some of the things that have been removed but I'm pretty certain most inside the 20 mile an hour zone doesn't what I found useful about that little software tool that I used is there's a little click box where you can actually put the diagram number in and then check that on a 20 mile an hour zone and then you can see if there's a difference so that can be done quite easily and checked someone who makes a comment in making a good case for design placement consideration yes I, I perfectly agree that is generally the purpose yeah, someone make comments on the bridge sign you would also have an advanced sign before the bridge that would be appropriately positioned and high and, and lit so you wouldn't need to light that particular sign absolutely if you've got the signage in place if that's just a reminder you are doing what you can to serve drivers if you're simply putting in another sign to, to as a mem aid memoir to help someone on the journey then absolutely and the last question can we get a copy of the presentation we get asked that every time we do not send out the presentation in any kind of PDF or paper format simply because it can't be delivered correctly because I do a lot of talking as you've just found out but we will send you out a link to a YouTube video copy of it where you can watch it ad infinitum at your leisure okay I, I have here one question do you know the approximate difference in cost of R1 RA2 and R3B materials what I will do if you wouldn't mind is I will get one of our guys to give you a call Right, thank you very much for your time and please do sign up for our next webinar. If you have any comments, you will be given a survey at the end of this. Please do fill it out honestly. We do need feedback. We do need to understand how we can make these sessions better, quicker, shorter, longer or what information you need. Thank you very much for your time. Good afternoon.